Um, let's see, am I on the screen highlighted? Cause it doesn't look like that. Yes, you are. You are, you're, you're on camera. You're the only one on camera and you okay. on screen, so go right ahead. <laughs> Got it. Um, well, first of all, I'm Dina Moses, and um, I am talking to you from Putney, Vermont. Um, and I want to thank um, the Hand Weavers Guild of America for this wonderful opportunity to speak about something that I'm really passionate about. Um, and this talk is going to be different from, from the other two talks in that I'm just going to, I really want us to think a little bit about who we are as weavers and how we relate to each other as weavers. Um, I also want to acknowledge that part of this, it's, it's that the last 18 months have been really, really hard. Um, and whether you've been directly affected, whether it's just the fact that, you know, it's like everything in the world has changed and this is difficult. And for me, weaving has been a real solace. Um, so I feel a little bit protective about weaving and about my weaving communities. Um, I have been weaving for 35 years. Um, I live, eat, and breathe weaving. Um, and over that 35 years, weaving has changed a lot. Um, the equipment has changed, the yarns we have access to, techniques, the way information is shared, the whole emergence of weaving patterns, just so much has changed. Um, and I want to put that in the context of the arc of knowledge around weaving that spans millennia throughout the world. Weaving and humans evolved together. Big, big. You know, and because of this, there are many different techniques, many different kinds of equipment and processes. Um, and weaving connects us to all of human evolution. I mean, wow, you know, that's just, for me, that's great. Um, here are some things that I believe. This is our foundation. Um, weaving will often draw people who like to have some control in their lives. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, it's like you've got these threads on your loom and you've got these, you know, you get to control them. They all have to do what you want them to do when it's going well. Um, and you're not yelling at your kids and you're not destroying your relationships. It's a great outlet for that control and, um, and for that need for order. Um, so let's just like keep that in mind. Um, I also really believe that just because another weaver has told you something, and that includes me right now, all right? Just because another weaver has told you something, even if that weaver has a lot more experience than you do, even if that weaver happens to be a very, very respected teacher internationally, whatever, it doesn't mean, one, that it is correct. Um, hold on one sec, I apologize. I was gonna start a timer, okay. It doesn't mean that it's correct. And what I mean is, is you know, I've been teaching for 15 years now. There are things five and 10 and 15 years ago that I have said to my weavers. And then, you know, I'm open, I'm learning new techniques, I'm listening to people. And all of a sudden I realized, you know what? There's a better way of doing this. And somebody who I taught five or 10 years ago, maybe I told them something different. So just keep that in mind. It's, we weaving teachers sometimes say things that aren't exactly correct. The second thing is whether or not what somebody else says is right for you. And that goes back to, um, the piece about order and control and how we like things to look. And maybe what they're explaining works beautifully for them and who they are, it may not work for you. So what I really wanna encourage you to do is have your own authority over your process. Um, in North America, specifically the United States, there has been an amazing amount of weaving innovation over the last hundred years. Um, equipment, methods, just so much. Um, and maybe in Canada too, I'm just not as familiar with Canadian weaving history. Um, another thing, I believe that weaving creates a path for people with predominantly analytical brains who have never made an object of art in their lives to learn that they can be creative and they can make beautiful things. And that over time, because of the emotionally safe foundation, right, here are these threads, um, 
emotionally safe foundation that's created by threads going in one direction, interlaced with threads going in the other direction, people who have never imagined that they could become artists, I fall into that category. My background is math and science, and I never, ever thought I was an artist. And then I took up weaving. And over time that developed. Um, the other side of that is that weaving can create a path for people who consider themselves artists um, and think a little bit more like that intuitively um, to become more comfortable with their mathematical and analytical side. It's incredible. I mean, we just have access to this amazing thing. Um, so being able to create beautiful things that are outside of the realm of who you believe you are has the capacity to empower you in ways that nothing else can. I also believe that this is a very vulnerable place for most people. You know, So as we interact with each other, I wanna remember that vulnerability, you know, and especially now as we're in this very vulnerable time in the world. Um, I just want to say, you know, like Deb, when she, at the very beginning, when she said that weaving um, felt like coming home to her, that's what it felt like to me. And I expect that that's what it's felt like to a lot of you. Um, so I want to take some time and look at how we as weavers can become attached, right? That's the shadow side. We can become attached to the way we do things as the right way. Um, so many weavers, so many ways. So. I'm not here to tell anyone that they should or shouldn't be doing any part of the process differently. In fact, it's just the opposite. What I wanna do is I wanna celebrate the differences in how we do things and encourage you to celebrate these differences as well. So um, I'm just gonna open up the can of worms. Warping often is the thing that brings up the fireworks when groups of weavers get together and I'm gonna focus on this. Um, front to back, back to front, right? Like that's the big thing. That's what's gonna get weavers really worked up. Um, the thing is that within each of these methods, there are countless ways to do many of the steps, right? So I've seen so often people saying, oh, you know what? Like you have tension issues in your warp. That's because you're front to back warping. If you back to front warp, then that won't happen. Well, you know, there's so many steps and um, it very well might not be that, you know? It might be that some step along the way didn't quite happen the right way, or maybe somebody took a piece from here and a piece from here in terms of different warping methods and tried to put them together and they don't really work so well and there was kind of a hole, all right? So I wanna tell you that either method done well will give you a perfectly tensioned warp. And that's our goal, okay? Um, I did get down a bit of a rabbit hole in preparation for this talk. And I looked through every weaving book in my possession. And these books span the last 90 years because I wanted to get a sense of what people have been teaching over time, you know? And, um, and every single one of them is different. And I actually put a stack, let's see if we can see this. There's my stack of all, and that's not all my weaving books, but it's all the weaving books that have warping as, as something that they're covering. Um, going from book to book to book really confirmed my belief that back to front and front to back are very limited terms and they just do not tell us enough. You know, it's like, I almost want to just, whoever came up with those terms, I want to get rid of them because there's so much more than that. And in some people, you know, even if they do the opposite ways, their weaving is going to be more similar. Um, some, you know, people are going to be, it's going to be more different. Um, so, um, when a warp is not perfectly tensioned, it's not gonna be an issue of which of these two methods you have used. It's gonna be a question of some detail within the method that isn't working. I spend a lot of time talking to weavers about the minutia of how they weave. Um, through Vermont Weaving Supplies and Vermont Weaving Clubs, I run these office hours for my clubs and we get a bunch of weavers together at all different levels. And over and over and over again, the question is, I have tension issues, what should I do? And weavers sometimes think that's the question, you know, but there's so many things that it could be. Um, so 
I got to get more information, right? At what point in your weaving do you start noticing the uneven tension? Is it at the beginning of your warp? Is it in the middle of your warp? Is it later than that? Is it one or two threads or is it a group of threads? If it is more than a few threads, how close are they together in your warp? Or maybe they're spread out. Is it in the center of your weaving? Or is it at the selvage? If it's at the selvage, which selvage? Um, you're getting the idea. Do you try and hold the warp while you are turning the crank, which leads to tension issues at the left side of your warp? Every time somebody says that the left side of their warp is, is um, having tension issues, that's always what I think of. What kind of a packing material are you using? Have you looked at the back of the loom to make sure that your packing material is placed consistently and that all threads are going over it? And then same thing for broken threads. If you're breaking threads, are they at the edge or the center of your weaving? Do they tend to break at the fell line or near the reed or closer to the heddles? Because each one is a different set of issues. Um, so let's go back a little bit to um, the piece about how weaving draws people who like control and order in their lives, all right? Um, and with the piece that um, it's very, it's, it, it, weaving can be a very vulnerable place for a lot of us. Um, and that we tend to be highly kinesthetic people. We learn with our hands, right? We, it matters to us what something feels like. Each one of us has a different sense of what order means. And we want our warping process to feel good in our bodies and to appeal to our personal sense of order, all right? Um, and, a, and I am, so here we go, I am a front to back warper. And I think that there can be within the community, within the weaving community, some shaming around people who are front to back warpers. I don't understand it. Um, I can come up with a lot of theories, you know. As far as I can tell for a long time, we were talking about um, wear and tear on the threads because of the heddles. 35 years, I've never seen that as an issue. Maybe heddle technology has changed since people started saying that, I'm not sure. Maybe the loom um, geometry has changed so the threads go through the heddles in a different way. Um, so on a personal level, the reason that front to back warping appeals to me is that the threads are separated out from the beginning of the warp to the end of the warp. That's my sense of order, all right? Everything, it's, it's you know, the thing about, threads separated out in groups that you have with back to front, um, just, it feels wrong in my body. What we lose is the gracefully attaching to the warp to the back beam. So warping methods are not the only things that weavers dig their heels in about. Um, how to throw the shuttle, which shuttle is best, how to handle the weft, whether or not to use a temple, floating selvages, waiting selvages, weighted selvages, the list goes on and on and on, all right? Um, when I see and hear weavers with more experience telling weavers with less experience that the reason that they are having issues with their warp is because they should be warping back to front rather than front to back or some other thing that they should be doing. It does feel a little bit heartbreaking to me, you know, because you're, you're kind of squashing somebody a little bit, you know, and, and I think that, that what we really need to do, you know, this isn't serving each other. Um, and we're not being good mentors and teachers for each other. And really, like, what if we stop telling each other that some methods are inherently better than other methods? What if instead we asked questions and then stopped to listen? How do you do each step? How does it feel for you? What did your warp look like when you did that? When we start, we slow down, right? And we start asking questions and we start getting more of a sense of who this person is and um, how, who they are in relationship to what's going on. The gift that we give is the gift of allowing someone to be more of themselves and to more fully explore the methods that really feel good in their body. The gift that we get is that weavers with less experience will figure things out that we weren't able to. 
and give us new and innovative methods. And for me personally, as a teacher, that's a lot of how my weaving knowledge has grown is from my students. You know, they just, something doesn't feel right to them and they work with it and I work with them on it and they come up with something brand new and then I can integrate it into what I do. Um, so, you know, once we start doing that, once we start really listening to each other more about our methods and how they feel, um, we can open the door to creating a more compassionate weaving community, which is going to be a great thing for all of us. So thank you for um, listening. Thank you so much, Dina. We really appreciate your participation. And we thank all of our speakers today um, during this session, Deborah, Ray, and Dina. Um, that concludes our first Thread Talk presentation of today. Um, our next session coming up at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time is a Marketplace Live featuring Mary M. Waite, Weaver, and Dyer. We'll see you all there.